on there. So here we go with our safety video for the morning. worker was using a wire wheel on a sheet of metal when a tiny piece of wire shot out at high speed and pierced his eyeball. Not even an eighth of an inch long, the projectile caused too much damage to save his eye. Think this is just a harmless little screw? It was in the grass when a man edging the lawn with a powered string trimmer hit it, instantly turning it into a missile traveling fast enough to shoot directly into the center of his eyeball, penetrating the pupil and embedding itself deeply in the vitreous body. A man using a handheld sprayer squirted parts cleaner on some metal pieces. The stream of spray bounced back and hit him in both eyes. When the solvent made contact with his eyeballs, it started burning through the tissues covering the cornea. Blinded and screaming in pain, the chemicals caused extensive damage because it took him almost 20 minutes to find his phone so he could call for help. The delay cost him most of the vision in one eye and 15% in the other. A maintenance worker was refueling a generator when some of the fuel spilled over and hit the hot engine manifold, causing a flash fire. The fire was strong enough to burn off most of his eyebrows and some of his hair. The skin around his facial area received first degree burns. When he took his safety glasses off, the only part of his face that had not been touched was around the eyes. Doctors told him that the safety eyewear he had been wearing saved his eyes and without them he might have been blinded for life. Almost 70% of eye injuries result from flying or falling objects or sparks striking the eye. Of the objects that caused the worst eye injuries, more than 60% of them were smaller than a pinhead. Most of these damaging little missiles were traveling at high speed when they injured the eyes. Chemicals in the eye account for almost 20% of eye injuries. Good safety eyewear is inexpensive, lightweight, easy to keep clean, and scratch resistant. Choose safety glasses that meet universal standards for proper eye protection. For example, OSHA requires protective eyewear in the United states to meet the minimum standards established by the American National Standards Institute or ANSI. If you already wear glasses, your prescription lenses can be made to ANSI standards. Most safety eyewear also blocks damaging UV rays. And you can get safety eyewear for indoors or outdoors, and you can even get ones that are bifocal with varying degrees of magnification. Remember to wear your eyewear when working around the house. More than twice as many eye injuries occur at home than in the workplace. But whether you're at work or at home, don't be blindsided in an accident. Wear protective eyewear. video I, I like it so uh what, what did you want to discuss there do you have any more that you wanted to add hello right yeah uh no i think i'm good no just huh. yeah. <laughs> okay so uh did you look at any of the specs or the specifications for the safety glasses required in the utility industry? I watched one video and it, I, f I forgot what they were called. I don't know the, I forgot what one of them were called. Okay. It was uh, one of the OSHA requires. I don't, I forgot what it was called. Right, right. Uh, it was like, it started with an N, it was N and like some numbers behind it or something like that. Okay. Uh, do you remember the hard hat video we saw? Oh, uh, yes, sir. What was the number, the letter and the numbers for the minimum minimum requirement for the hard hat? Do you anybody remember that? Z85. Z1, two numbers higher. 87. Z87.1. Okay. That's the minimum required requirement. They also have the, like we said, Z89.1. Well, guess what number is the minimum minimum minimum? minimum Minimum requirement for uh, safety glasses. Z87. Excellent. Z87.1. 
that's an ANSI OSHA safety standard. Now, what does Z87.1 mean in a safety glass? Does anybody have that information or know that? They're at least two millimeters thick. Okay. Where'd you find that out, Aaron? Um, just I just knew it because my family owns a logging business and we're required to wear them pretty much oh, all the cool. time. So cool, we got some background there. So uh the two millimeters thick, Aaron, uh let us know. And they have that, I would say that was be the impact resistance, right? Yes, sir. All right. So impact resistance, flying objects and whatnot. They also have, even in a clear glass now, on the Z87 and Z89.1, what they call flash resistance. Anybody got any idea what flash resistance is? Arc flash? Or welding or uh, fires? Correct, all right. Uh, in fact, I'll, I'll do this right here. They're the potential for electrical arcs in the industry is uh, high. So you're gonna have to wear some kind of uh, eye protection to protect your eyes from the arc flash itself. Not only the heat from it, but the arc flash from blinding you. All right, so hold on one second. Uh, I wanna get one that's... for something i'll share a screen here real quick let me know when you got it got it in four different we've got that book a vacation rental now and get up to 20 percent back in travel credits by using promo code rental 20. welcome back to travel booking.com <laughs> You can look, but don't touch. These arcs of plasma are lethal enough to kill on contact. In this project, we're using an old microwave oven transformer to extract these traveling electric arcs. There it goes. This is lethally high voltage, but not quite enough to start on its own. The electrode wires diverge it up. Okay, so you see the electrical arc that's going through those two pieces of wire right there. This is a, really in small intensity. When you're working with high voltages, such as that we use in the industry, that electrical arc puts out the same heat, higher, hotter than the sun. There is no heat that's been generated higher than electrical arc as far as we know on earth, okay? Even out there in space, it's hotter than the surface of the sun. Also at high intensity, it's blinding. Anybody ever you know, taken a picture and got that flash and had that in your eyes and you can't see for a little bit? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, same thing, but very, very high intensity. Some arc flashes, um, we'll talk about clothing later on that you're supposed to wear. Some arc flashes can totally engulf your body, okay? So really there's the safety glasses are multi-purpose right there. And I've seen it save many a lineman's eyes in the process. Professor V, you got anything else to add? Yeah, <clears throat> I'll give you one, an experience that happened to me. Of course, these are, these are just my reading glasses. I wear contacts. I used to wear um, just regular glasses when I went to work with the power company, that was when they were really transitioning, you know, into contacts and they really wouldn't let us wear contacts back then because of the potential for an arc flash. It, you know, if you didn't have the right safety glasses on and you got an arc flash, it would melt your contact to your eye. So um, back then we weren't, we were prohibited from wearing them. So my glasses that I had to wear were uh, prescription safety glasses and i was in a meeting in florence um standing in the hallway we were taking a break and all of a sudden there was this loud pop and my left lens in my glass exploded and um 
put it shattered the safety glass into part of my eye. Um, so anything that's man-made, if they say it's safety, you know, that don't mean it's a hundred percent. You want to do everything that you can do. Of course, I didn't have no way of knowing that, you know, that the safety glasses were faulty. And um, of course I had to go to the eye doctor and they had to pull the glass out of my eye but you just don't never know guys and you want to do everything you can. Just like in the video, you saw where the screw penetrated that lens just because it says safety does not mean something cannot penetrate it, you know, or damage it or, you know, shatter it. It may say shatter resistant, but it may crack. Part of it may splinter off. So guys, just be aware just do all you can to make sure you minimize the hazards that are out there. Just, just, just because you got on a hard hat, safety glasses or whatever, that don't mean you can't get hurt. You saw in the video where, you know, last week where the hard hat, the bolt hit the, or the, whatever was falling down and it would hit the top of the hard hat and it put an indention in the top of that metal model. If that's your head, then you're going to get an indention. You, you know, you, you might get a light concussion or something, but you're not dead, you know. You, you, that hard hat is doing its job, and it's, you know, it can only protect you so much just as safety glasses can too. So um, don't don't put 100% trust in it. You know, you're not going to get hurt by, you know, different things out in there because this really is, guys, a, um, a pretty dangerous job, a field of work you're going into. But you do all you can to prevent safety hazards, you stay in your minimum approach distances, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on, those kinds of things, and, and you'll be fine. But um, just be aware that just because you got on, um, uh, you know, different safety gear that, you know, something can't happen because it can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Safety is here for your protection, but don't think it's a safety blanket. Don't think it's something that you can get behind and then, oh, well, I'm free to do as I please. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'll give you one more screen here. You know, and that's a this is, uh, 480 volts. And this is probably, uh, Professor V will probably uh, agree with me right here, one of the most dangerous voltages there are. Yes. 480. Uh, even the higher voltages are not as dangerous as this one. And we'll go into explanations why. But this guy is fully outfitted. Looks like he's got his gloves on, a helmet. Uh, all of his safety gear. I just want you to see the arc flash that occurs uh, when he closes this, when they uh, energize this. I don't think there's any sound to it. It's gonna be a slow-mo. So all the sparkly stuff that you see right there, that's molten metal flying. He hasn't even acknowledged it. It's a dummy. They're they're doing a test here. Okay. <laughs> it's a staked up dummy that they're putting in here, and they're testing. They're actually just testing the gear right here. Uh, yeah, I got you. Okay. The concussion. I can guarantee, you guys, the concussion from the explosion right here is going to knock you back 10, 15 feet. Yeah, that's what I thought. I thought just from the explosion, you'd be gone. Yeah, but yeah. you still have all the metal pieces in your face. Right. It's going to knock you down. They're just doing this for a test purpose. But it will, I mean, it gives you an idea of what's going yeah. on. Yeah. What can happen. So are the bigger voltages, are they a bigger arc flash? Or is that just the most dangerous? No. And, you know, I, I like the way when I was learning about it at, at my work, an arc flash is an arc flash no matter what the voltage is. It, yeah. It's kind of weird. The higher the voltage does not really determine the intensity of all this explosion and, and, and uh, arc that you see going on here. It's like a fault, <laughs> a fault on a system is a fault, okay? okay. Uh, and I mean, we'll go into this a little bit short, uh, a little later on. The system protection in uh, higher voltages is more sensitive it is, than it is in lower voltages. It's just to be uh, the short description of it. But you see, you see here in the beginning, 
I'll try to pause it when it happens. That little bit starting to come out. You see how it's white? Mm -hmm. that, that's the initial contact and explosion. And, you, and you're looking, that is very, very intense light right there. Mm -hmm. When that occurs, then, all, then from that point on, bang, everything's just in meltdown mode. Yeah, and then it's pushing you. Right, right. It, it'll definitely push you back. Okay. Well, yeah. I see it. Intense. Yeah. All right. And well, two, what you need to what you need to remember with this too is he's working inside of a cab, an enclosed cabinet, which mm -hmm. you know, linemen do with transformers and such like that. And the force of that blast is forced out that door or that mm -hmm. opening right there. So it don't have nowhere to go but out. And he's standing, he's the door. Mm -hmm. So he's he's getting the full brunt of that force. It's right, focused in that one direction. It's, it's going to go somewhere. That's for dang sure. Okay. Stop sure. All right. So let me, Professor V, before you start there, get over here. Well, let, let me just make one other comment about that, if you would. Um, You guys, I know um, Professor Shoemaker told me y'all were climbing last week and up the pole, up to the neutral level. And I'm um, glad you guys got that far with it. But, you know, if you're up on top of a pole, and you know, you got your, your primaries that are on top and there's an arc flash up there. It's got a 360 circle of exposure to vent out. So it may, it may have less of an impact on you. It may have more, there's no way to tell. You just have to um, make sure you got on, on your safety gear, no matter if you're working in a transformer like that, or if you're working on top of a pole or whatever, just make sure all your safety gear is in place and you want to minimize that hazard. Absolutely. That's my old bill, $972. My new one, $28 a month. Or if I pay full, $157 every six So you can see it uh, perfectly in Professor V's example. When you're in open air there, that arc flash has 360 degrees, you know, a total area to go around. And you see it's just not that intense as 480 volts, okay? Wind can blow an arc out. When an arc occurs, you see how the power lines are bouncing back and forth. That's what we call galloping due to the high intensity uh, load that's going on in there. Getting the best video, guys. It's like a settle down. There you go. Yeah, perfect example right there of what Professor V was talking about. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and open this up here. And if you do have questions, please do ask them now. Got everybody together. I sent you the CDL. Uh, Posting in D2L and the CDL information as far as the college was in concern for continuing education. Did anybody have any questions there? Fire them away. So we all we want to just get our class A's and be done with it. When you have your class A uh, CDL with the college, yes. When you've got a class A with them, you are completed. You have it. You're good to go. All right, did it uh, give the duration of the class? I think it's five weeks, okay? And you can do it immediately after this course, after you schedule with continuing education. Mark Elliott, did you have a question? It was about the permit, the CDO permit, like if you're not continuing your education. Okay, if you guys... I what we like do. all I gotta do is just make time, go to the DMV, take mm -hmm. the test, mm -hmm. pay eight dollars for the test and my uh, my driving record, and then I'm good to go. Just show it to y'all once I once it comes in the mail. Right, and you're going to need here, guys. You you caught most of the most of the uh, things that you're going to need there. You're going to need they're going to do a background check on you. 
as far as your driving record. You're gonna to need to pay $8 for the test at the DMV. You're gonna need a DOT physical. Now don't go out and get a uh, normal physical. Normal physical is gonna run you about $150. All right, you're gonna get a DOT physical. That's gonna run you anywhere between 50 and 75. So cut your prices in there, cut your prices in half there. Then you're gonna be able to go and take the CDL permit test. I would highly recommend go online. The CDL permit test questions are online. A multitude of them. Study those, study the harder ones. Some are common sense. Some study the harder ones. And when you go to, in to take the test, the permit test at the DMV, they pull from those test questions. Like it's like a pool of questions. So you're not going to get all of them. You're going to get a, a select amount of questions in that DOT permit. We as professors, once that permit, you show us a picture of it, we'll take any grade from now until the end of the courses and substitute that for the permit. That'll be an A, 100, not on exams. Okay. Quizzes, quizzes and tests, but say well, you got a 50 on a test or a quiz, it, it's gone. We're gonna put a hundred in there if you provide us the permit. Uh, yeah. What if you don't well, get it? Go ahead. The Go ahead, Mark. I talked over you. You you're fine. I kind of did you too. What's the latest you can bring your permit as long as we're still in the class? End of classes. Last yeah, day. Yeah. Okay. Last day of classes. Anytime. I'll give you plenty of time. Uh, also, say that uh, I've got my permit test scheduled for, and try to do it for the afternoons or on a Friday. Uh, I've got my permit test scheduled for ten o'clock on today. Well, you know, no problem. It's part of the class. If you need to go take that, take care of it. Be sure. I was looking to try to get it on a Friday. So yeah. the DMV was still open, but we didn't have. No yeah. So uh, get that worked out. Why are we asking you, requesting you, I don't know, I'll put it to you this way. We can't demand it. Okay. It's not a course requirement, but I can guarantee you, you go to work for a utility and Professor V will back me up on this, I'm sure. When you walk up and put that application in and you've got a CDL permit, CDLs are required for all these jobs, mm -hmm. a full CDL. Yep. If you don't have the full CDL and you've got your permit, you're gonna get in the door a lot better. I'll give you an example here. Some of the utilities, what do they start you out at? Does anybody know? Not 100%. I have and a friend that just started Who was saying 16? 16, 15. Okay. Yeah, I think it's they sixteen. Right, I, heard so, they, I heard they start you out at sixteen. If you come, if you come to them with a CDL, they'll start you out around eighteen or so. Here we there exactly. You walk up to the door, Tristan, and you got nothing as far as your CDL requirements is sixteen. You walk up with a permit at seventeen, and you walk up with a license is eighteen. Because so, you got you got that CDL to drive the bucket truck around. Correct, correct, and that's not only with them; that's with all utilities. Okay, right. well, thank you. That's cleared up. Yep, flip that, flip that. You guys get your CDL permit, and I'm not saying not to get your CDL license. Investigate the company that you're going to be applying for and mm -hmm. ask them, do you train on site for your CDL license? Now, the college CDL costs you right around $5,000. It's fully covered by scholarship. It'll be paid for, but... Some organizations will train you in-house to get mm -hmm. your CDL license. Mm -hmm. It's just, I mean, it makes you guys <clears throat> look just a lot better when you do an application. You've got at least the permit and icing on the cake is, uh, I mean, the question's going to come up. Do you have your CDL license? And so you say yes, man, you're going to be looking good. Professor V? Yeah, most everybody, you know, you're going to an organization with your permit you know they have an understanding that hey this guy's coming in off the street he has no way to get a um a cdl no kind of truck or anything to take the test unless he's gone through some kind of training program so you know they want to help you get your um cdl license the full license um because that makes you a big asset to their company and um they're going to invest the time and money in the, into you as part of your training program to get that done. So um, 
it's out there. There's different avenues to get it done. Guys, I, I encourage you to fill out the um, the scholarship paperwork that's out there uh, for the school. Uh, that's an excellent opportunity. It's free to you. Just have to make sure you know you're a South Carolina resident. You're over 18 years of age. And then uh, make sure when you do fill out the paperwork, Ms. Um, Julie Golden sent me a note and said to make sure you fill out every every piece of paper that, that is involved with that scholarship. Make sure you fill it out completely. Don't leave anything out. Yeah. Okay? I know I so, sent those. Sent those well, keep going. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Professor. Wait. No, I'm good. I, that's about all I was going to say. But I just let me just say that, you know, it's going to cost a little money, like Professor Schumacher said, to get your um, your physical. I got mine last year. I had to redo my CDL last year. I still got it. And I think my physical cost me 125 bucks at Doctor's Care. But um, it's well worth the money for you guys to go ahead and get this stuff knocked out. Because that is, and I, and I say it every class, that CDL is gold. Mm -hmm. Gold. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's what they want you to have. The, the storm that's going down through Louisiana, down in that area right now, CDL is to drive trucks to get down there. You know, you know that's what it takes. And you're going to be a part of that company. They're going to want you to drive. If you yep. can't get in the bucket, you're going to be behind the wheel of that truck driving that a lineman around. So he can work. He don't have to worry about driving and then, you know, working the bucket or whatever. So uh, it's gold. 100%. Uh, I think, I uh, can't remember who it was over the weekend, Edric or somebody had texted me, wow, what do you want us to do? You want us to print up all this paperwork and fill it out and then bring it to you or whatnot? You guys, you got that option is one. Don't bring it to me. You're going to have to send it to Julie Golden. Uh, if you want to bring it to me and have me send it to her, I will. Or if weather permits and everything goes as planned, we'll do this Thursday like we did that Thursday. I've got one, two, three. I've got about 15 packets here that she sent me. So I can just hand you a packet. Uh, I looked at it. Dude, that's a ton of paperwork. Mm -hmm. But this takes care of all the D, the college and the DOT paperwork at one time. So this take care of all your college uh, requirements here as far as the packets are concerned and all the DOT requirements as far as their paperwork is concerned. So you can have that all done at one time. All right, a lot of information there. Any, any questions for me? All right, Professor V, you wanna carry on? You wanna take a break? It's 8.36. Um, let's, let's, uh... Go until about eight forty-five ish. Okay, uh, I'm gonna do something else here. Hold on one second. Sorry, I, my internet went out again. Can you cut recording back off again? Hold on. And if I drop out, I'll go ahead and apologize now. If it happens, I hope it doesn't. I went down and reset everything again. So, okay. Where did you all end off last week before Unit 13 when you started talking about trans transformers and De decimal fractions is what we went into. And we actually, uh, in the last about 45 minutes, uh, we brought up the definition of volts, amps, resistance, and watts. Okay. We also uh, threw a transform up there and did some calculations for determining using Ohm's law chart. Okay. Okay, good deal. That's what I was, I was looking at. Well, quiz two and wanted to see how far you got with it. So um, we'll go ahead and roll on, guys. And Professor Schumacher, if you get a second, could I get you to um, find me a good nameplate with a KVA, a visible good, KVA yeah. rating and a impedance? And well, working those. on it right now. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. But guys, we're on um, page 70. Unit 13, uh, basic principles of multiplication of decimal fractions. Um, and uh, this kind of, we're going along back, back into multiplication. Um, and the multiplication of decimal fraction is the same basic procedure as multiplication of whole numbers. Um, the only difference with that is, is so I can, you'll see the example 
down here on page 70, it's got 8.650 times 3.5. Um, you just go ahead and multiply like you did with the um, numbers before the whole numbers. When you get done multiplying and then adding down below the multiplication line, then you then you move your decimal points over. Just like that 8.6, you'd move it over one, two, three, three spaces. And then at the bottom 3.5, you'd move it over four. So you actually move it over four. I mean, I'm sorry, 3.5, you'd move it over one spot. And then you'd go back and when you get your final uh, answer, it would be 30.2750. And I'm sorry, I do not have a Wacom with me to write that down. And I hate to keep bugging Professor Schumacher about no, this. No, no, no. And, uh, you know, I'll talk about it for just a minute. Uh, hey guys, I'm sure some of you are younger and took some kind of different math in school. You know, I've got a 17-year-old daughter and I've seen some different procedures that I would never use before. Of course, a calculator works every time. Yes. But I was taught in school, don't even worry about the decimals. Yet, yeah. multiply 335 times 8,650. Yeah. And once you have that number, count the decimal places. One, yeah. 3.5 has one decimal place. Uh, 8.650 has three. So three plus one is four. Once you've got that final answer, just move back four decimal places in your answer. So, you know, multiple ways of doing it. Uh, yeah. And a hunter camel got kicked. How about that? Uh -oh. Okay. And stop share. Okay. You should have a whiteboard there. Nope, it's there. I gotta find my trusty little writing stick. Okay, I'm ready. Okay, just and, and we're gonna go down just like we talked about in the example. And guys, I know word problems aren't the easiest thing to go through sometimes, but it kind of makes you think a little bit. So we're gonna um, jump on this practical problem number one because it deals with a um, little bit of wattage and you know, kilowatts. It says, how much does it cost to operate a heater that uses 0 0.45 kilowatt of power if kept on for one hour? That's 0 0.45, okay? The cost is point or 0 0.38 point kilowatt hour. So how much did he use? that uses 0 0.045 kilowatts of power if it's kept on for one hour. The cost is 0.38 per kilowatt hour. So all we have to do there is run the math. Yeah. 0.45 times 0.038. So what do we end up with? Anybody got a calculator? It's 0.38, not 0.038. Sorry about that. Point, point three eight. I misunderstood that. Thank you. Thanks. Anybody? Easy to run in a calculator. I got point one seventy one. One seven one. That's correct. Okay. Guys, you got any questions about um? Multiplication of decimal fractions, pretty simple. Um, anybody want to go through another practical problem here? To, are we are we good with that? With that, you want to move on? Mm -hmm. The division of fractions. Okay. Um, when decimal fractions are divided, divider is the divisor is place to the list of the dividend in the same manner as in the division of whole numbers. When dividing decimal fractions, however, the divisor must be a whole number, not a fraction. The divisor can be made a whole number by moving the decimal point all the way to the right of the number. When this is done, the decimal point is divided. <clears throat> point of the dividend must be moved the same number of places to the right. So, what you do to the um, 
for one side of the fraction, you have to do to the other. So if you go 19.44 divided by 3.6, You've got, to, you've got to do it in a whole number, 3.6. You've got on that 3.6, you've got to move your decimal point one place over to the right. And what you did on that side, you've got to do to your other number, it'll be 194.4. And that, that's gonna give you a 5.4 answer. Yeah, running the calculator is a 5.4. Okay. Guys, these are these are little short sections we're going through. Um, did you talk about hundreds of places? Yes. One hundred thousands, ten thousands. Yeah, but we might want to go ahead and do that again. Were you looking at the the top of page seventy eight? Yes. All right. So I'll. Drop unit number, one, two, three, four, five, six. So we've got uh, in the first decimal point, tenths, second decimal, hundredths, third decimal point, thousandths, Fourth, ten uh, k, hundreds of thousands, ten, ten tens of thousands, then hundreds of thousands, then millions. Okay, yeah, we did go over that. Yeah. Okay, guys, and unit fifteen right there on the page before that, page seventy-seven. Um, we're changing common fractions to decimals. Fractions. So, um, a simple way of determining the denominator of any decimal fraction is to place a one to the left of the decimal, then place the same number of zeros that are are in the decimal fraction to the right of the decimal and remove the decimal point. And in the exam, in this example, the decimal fraction point zero zero four five zero is given. There are five digits to the right of the decimal. Rewrite the number as described as 100,000. So you move it all the way. <clears throat> so rewrite, what's that, 100,000? Uh huh. Okay. So point four, that'd be 450 over 100,000. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, now, changing common fractions to decimal fractions. All right, a common fraction is expressed is an expression of division. It is possible to change any common fraction into the decimal equivalent by adding the numerator, I'm sorry, by dividing the numerator by the denominator. All right, you've got three eighths, and you wanna go three divided by eight, and that's when you want to use your, your calculator. Yeah, and uh, the common uh, thing that we see sometimes happening during tests and quizzes here is you punch it in in the wrong order. Right. If I, I want to make this a decimal number. It's three divided by eight, not eight right. divided by three. Yes. Remember, it's, it's going to be a decimal of some type, if you come up with a whole number, like two point something, then you put it in your calculator incorrectly. So it's three divided by eight punched in the calculator equals what? 0.375. Okay. Questions? How about um, nine sixteenths? What decimal was that going to be? Need an answer from somebody. Give me an answer, please. Point five. 
So you took 16 divided by nine. I could probably say 18. No, wait, never mind. Never mind. Is point is it, five. I thought you said eight. Five. Yeah, my bad. I thought you said eight. All right. Well, what was that? Point what? Is it is it a point six two five? Six two five. I don't know. I have a calculator on. <laughs> I didn't look. I just think that's what it is. Oh, you just think five seven six. Well, I mean, you say it's point five six. Point five six two five. Yep. Point five six two five. Got you. How about three fourths? Anybody? Well, that's an easy one. Point seven five. Yeah. Point seven five. How did you get that so quick? Why did you think of that one so quick? As a simple math. Simple 75%. math. Seventy-five percent. I think yeah, seventy-five percent. I think of money. Yeah. Four, yeah. Four quarters equals a dollar. Three quarters is thirty-five cents. Excellent. Okay. All right. All right. Um, how about the um, – any more questions about that, guys, about fractions, how to change um, fractions into decimals, into decimal fractions, um, how to switch them, uh, put um, fractions into decimal, those kinds of things. I think we – was pretty much some of that stuff was on the first quiz, was it not? Yep, a little bit. Okay, that's cool. That's cool. All right, combine. Um, just go. Let's go over to um, page eighty-one, unit sixteen. Now we got fifteen. Um, let's look at um, page eighty-one here. This unit provides practical problems when um, involving combined operations of addition, subtraction, multiplication. Okay. Am I going out again? No, you're fine. That was okay. me. Okay. And division of decimal fractions. As with whole numbers and common fractions, the standard, the standard order of operation must be followed. All right. <clears throat> All right. And that, that goes to like when we talked about putting putting numbers in brackets. Let's do the first example. Uh, we got 0 0.25 plus. 0 0.6 in parentheses times point, I'm sorry, yeah, well, it is 0 0.5. The first thing we got to do is add what's in the parentheses. Okay, let's do the parentheses work first. So 0 0.25 plus 0 0.6 equals what? Anybody? 0 0.85. 0.85. All right, then multiply 0 0.85 by 0 0.5 or 0 0.5. What's that give us? 0 0.425. 425. Everybody get that okay? Remember, guys, when you're doing this stuff, always do what's in your brackets first. Get that out the way. Knock that stuff out and then multiply it by or add or whatever's left um, to get your that, right answer. Is that correct? 0.425? Yeah. That is correct. Half, yeah. And you know, that's 0.5 is half. Yep. That's half of 0.85 is 0.425. Good, good work. Yep. All right. Uh, do we need to do the next example? Let's, um, let's do uh, this. Um, 0 0.15 plus 1.3 times 2. So we look, work left to right. Okay. So 1.3 times 2. Is that correct? Six. And then add the result which is 0.15. Okay. We've got. So one three times two comes down to 2.6. Yeah. Plus mm -hmm. 0.15. And that's going to be 2.75. 2.75, that is correct. Okay. 
Okay. All right. Any questions about that, guys? That's you, that was on uh, Unit 16. We can jump on over here to page 86, Unit 17, percent and percentages. Um, Before you jump into that, God, yeah. I know you guys, I know math is tough and it's hard to drag along by. But this is important. This is very important right here. You're going to get yeah, some that, information here that you're going to use well into the future. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And then just I'm going to read through a little bit of this stuff. And then we're going to pull up some. Um, there you go. Uh, and guys, that if you if you haven't talked about it before, guys, um, just like you saw out on the field, those transformers that are hanging on poles. I, did we still have any more on the poles out there, or are they all on the ground? Well, they're hanging on the short pole. Short pole, yep, short poles, guys. This, this picture that you see on your screen is a um, the, the transformer information. It's the name plate, and there's all kinds of information on this plate. You have, let's start right there. It's the manufacturer is Howard Industries. And then right below that, you have your KVA, which is 15. And guys, that's just not 15, that's kilo, which is 1,000. So that's 15,000 KVA, not just 15. Just remember that anytime you see um, a transformer rating in KVA, they just shorten that up, put a 15 on the, on the uh, name plate right there so it doesn't take up too much room, I guess. But KVA, that would be 15,000. If it was a 10 there, it would be 10,000. If it was a 25, it would be 25,000 and so forth. And uh, so on 37, 37,000. Um, and if you guys have, give, give me one second here. Um, in your news item, there is actually a sheet out there. I thought I had a copy of it right here at home with me, but it's, it's out there with the chart but it gives a transformer, um, you see it fuse, yeah, transformer sizes. There you go. There's your voltage, it's common transformer sizes right there on your right screen. Um, and it starts out at a five KVA, guys, and th that's a very small, that's 5,000, then you got a 10,000. Um, you got a 15,000, 25, and it goes all the way up to, and these are overhead transformers, guys. This is what's mounted either on a platform or on a pole. It goes up to three, um, 333 KVA or 30, 333,000 KVA. And I mean, that, that's, a, that's a huge transformer um, to put out in the field. So um, guys, if you need it, if you need that chart, you saw what Professor Schumacher went in your news to get it. Those that information is out there for you because you will need that. Need those transformer sizes, fuse sizes, and all. Um, you know, as we continue to talk about it, and you can see the the transformer that he's pulled up right there, three thirty three. Yeah, that's a huge transformer. That, that transformer probably weighs, what, about 2,000 pounds? Oh, more. no, no. I, I'm, you're looking probably on a 33, 333. I've seen her about 7,800, 8,000 pounds, about four tons. About four tons. Okay. Um, about six to eight feet high. Yep. Yep. I mean, it's, it's just a massive transformer. You can see to the left on that transformer, it has cooling fins. And these guys, these, these transformers are filled with oil and that's, it's a dielectric oil. And I mean, it's just there to keep the transformer cool with load and everything. So um, that's that transform. Now we're back down to a 15 KVA. So you can imagine what you see on the field. That's pretty much what we have on the field for our training purpose, 15 KVA transformer. Um, so that's a 15,000 volt amp transformer. Uh, can you give a good description of KVA for these guys, Professor Shoemaker? Yeah, we did last week. Let's see what they remember. 
for alignment, when I say 15 kVA, what does that loosely translate for us as alignment? Is it volts, amps, watts, or resistance? Volts. It's kVA. Remember in Ohm's law, volts. There's, there's a kVA. All three of these together. Watts. Watts, exactly. For a Lyman, loose translation here, Lyman, an engineer is going to tell you different, but not by much. This is a fifth, this transformer is able, capable of powering 15,000 watts. Just like my ball field, when I put that ball field up there and my ball field had 15 1,000 watt lights, this is the transformer I'd use for it because its output is. 15,000 watts. Back to you, Lee. Okay. All right, guys. Uh, we got that down pretty good. So move over to the next spot, impedance. Um, did you talk about impedance any? We did not. Okay. Uh, guys, there, there's a um, impedance is kind of like resistance in a transformer. But it's not, it's really, it is resistance, but it's resistance of voltage and current flow in a transformer. It's kind of like a, a natural um, resistance of the conductors that are inside of a transformer. It's everything has some kind of resistance inside of it. And that's what they call impedance, guys. It's, it's resistance of voltage and current flow that's inside of the transformer. Uh, we, um, we, we did talk about conductors and there is no perfect conductor. Right. So every conductor has some, some form of resistance. So yeah, that backs up exactly what you're saying. Yes, and that's, and you'll find that impedance in a transformer. And so, and, and let's, just, let's just jump into figuring something here, guys. If we're if we've got a fifteen thousand watt transformer, and our and our impedance, let's say that's two point six there, what would our true KVA be for that transformer? We're talking about true KVA with impedance. That resistance is going to knock that um, that wattage down a little bit. So, can anybody? Before we go into that, tell me how we figure that. So, you know, he, he kind of, you got to watch out, and this is going to come up on the quiz too. The way he stated the question, I've got a 15 kVA. I've got a 2.6% impedance. So it's being impeded by this much. He asked for the answer in kVA. Okay, make sure you give your answer in KVA, right? So if we've got a 15,000, use your calculators, 15,000 watt transformer. And there's several, there's different ways you can do this, but I like to do it. And I subtract 2.6%. You subtract. Yeah, I subtracted right. two point. I go in the direction of converting my percent to a decimal number. Okay. Okay. So what's two point six percent in a regular decimal number? Does anybody know how to convert a percentage to a decimal number? Want to be point two six. There you go. Just move this over one spot. 0. 0.26. Right. Now I'm ready to multiply it. Yeah. Go ahead. Multiply 15,000 by 0. 0.26. 2.9. 39. 2.939. I'm hearing a lot of stuff. 3.9. 3.9. Anybody else? Bring up a calculator here because that's not right. I got 3,900. 3,900. Wow, that's a lot. 
I thought it was point zero two six since it's yeah, you gotta point, move it over. It's yeah, two point six percent because that'd be twenty six percent decimal. Sorry about that. That's my bad right there. Point oh two six. Let me get my calculator out. Two five. So you all know the cancel. Let's see calculator. I'm gonna go one five. One, two, three, 15,000 times point oh two six equals 390. So everybody got the same thing? Yes, sir. All right, so I'm gonna take 390. And because it's a, an impedance, it's holding it back, I'm going to subtract it. So what's 15,000? Was 390 minus 15,000? Sounds like a bunch of 11 11s. 14,610. 14,610. Okay. Now, Professor V, when you, yes. asked, when you asked the original question, did you yes. ask for it in KVA or did you ask for it in watts? Watts to start with. Okay. So our answer here is already in watts because we converted 15,000 into watts. I mean, 15 KVA into watts, 15,000 watts. So our answer is good. What would this be if he asked for the answer in KVA? Oops, sorry about that, six, one, zero. All you have to do is move the decimal place over, 10, 100, 1,000. So your decimal place is moving here. K stands for 1,000, 14.61 KVA. You've got to watch the question. If it's answered in watts, give watts. If it's answered in KVA, you're going to have to move your decimal point over to the thousandths, move it over one thousandths, and then you've got your answer in KVA. Yeah. All right, let's let's try another one. Let's say let's say we got a um, a twenty-five KVA with a uh, let's say a 1.4% impedance. What is our KVA going to be on that, guys? He's asking for KVA now. KVA, KVA on that. What's the first step we're going to take? And I'm going to start calling on people. 45,000. I convert 25 KVA to 25,000. Um, What's the next we're going to do? Change, change your percentage into a decimal. Okay, so then we're going to change this to 0 0.014. What's the next? Then multiply. Step? Then multiply. Well, I'm glad to hear voices out there. All right, somebody find a solution for that? I got 24,650. Okay. 24,650. Yes. 24,650. So 25,000 times 0 0.014 is 24,650. Uh, That's what I got. 24.65 KVA. All right, guys, you're getting ahead of me. For everybody's. 350. 25,000 times 0.014. Oh, 350. 350. 350. Thank, you, right? Thank you. Okay. Right. 350 minus 25,000. Now fire it off. 20. 24, 650. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We're still in watts here. I need to convert to what? KVA. Go ahead. Let's move the decimal place. I got 24.65. Right. KVA. You're right. K in the KVA stands for thousands. So I'm going to move over 10, 100, 1000. Bingo. 24.65 KVA. Solution. Good work. Good work. Good job, guys. And you, and you you'll see some more of this stuff out there, guys. If you when you're going out, you're on with the utility and you're going out at uh, on a trouble call at night, you might have an overloaded transformer. You need to be able to figure, you know, your true KVA, the transformer, how much load you got, 
um, all these kinds of things figure in, and we'll talk about this more as we go along. So uh, pay pay attention to um, impedance, um, overload, uh, those kinds of things. Okay, what time we got? 9.33. Three. All right, you want to take about uh, 10? Or Sounds good. Well, let's do 12, make it 9.45. 9.45, guys. All right. So if I need to find, or I've got a number, we'll just throw some arbitrary number out there, 100. And I need to find 12.5% of 100. I need to either take it or add it to it, you know, give it to its benefit or subtract from it. I just always take that percentage number and convert. So 12.5% in a decimal is 0.125. And then I multiply each time. So 100 times uh, 1.25, break out my calculator. Just to make sure I'm doing it right. One hundred times 0.125 equals 12.5. If I need to, uh, if I'm discounting or I'm removing, taking away 12.5% of the 100, I'll just subtract it. If I'm giving it to the benefit or I'm uh, like interest, 12.5% interest, I'll just add it to whatever number I have that I'm using it against. So in this case, it's 100. So that'd be 112.5, All right? Does anybody else have a different method of how they do it? I do the, um, I subtract when I do that sometimes. Well, it depends if you're adding a uh, discounting or interest. Well, it's, it's just like we're talking about with the um, finding the impedance. If I've got a, a 15,000, a 15 kV output in 15,000, and what was our impedance on that 2.6%, I'll subtract 2.6% and hit the equals, and that'll give me my answer. So in your calculator, you're punching in 15,000. Yes, yeah, 15,000. Minus 2.6% in the calculator. Correct. And that'll give you your solution. That'll give me my solution. There you go, gentlemen. There's another method. All right, calculator entry is just like that. I'm sorry, B, I didn't see you on the list, so I just went I, ahead. That's all right, my, my um, internet dropped out again. Okay, no problem. Do uh, you wanna move into uh, transformer and uh, fuse overloads? Correct. Let me get, uh, <clears throat> unshare this one and share that other Word document. So share screen, screen two, share. Are we gonna do a, a quiz today? Uh, if we're there, yeah. Okay. I think we're, what we're touching on, what you hit last week, and we can do a little bit of review before we do it. Sure, sure. Um, it's just, a, I think today's just a 10 question and we're going to have to adjust question three on the quiz. Okay, we can do that. Looking at it. So anyway. Let me do this here real quick. Go uh, ahead. So the guys know what we're talking about. Let's see. Let's go images. So Based on what we talked about last week when I had a discussion with you and uh, what we're getting ready to, to jump into, I want to get one that's got a switch and a transformer. Here we go. Cool. So you just saw me bring up the fuse chart. And uh, some, not all, transformers 
are configured in this manner. I'll go through this part and this, uh, Professor V will go through the math, math part. You have a primary voltage on top. That's a much higher voltage. Off that primary voltage, I go into a switch. And if you're following my mouse, I have a fuse. Then I will go into the primary bushing of the transformer, which is on top, and that converts that to secondary. So th this is the, when we talk fuses and transformers, this is what we're talking about. The fuse is in place, well, it's like a fuse in your house or a little circuit breaker in your house. Why do we have a fuse on a transformer, gentlemen? So like the transformer? Yeah, I heard birds, I heard some, you know, squirrels, whatever. If something comes in contact up here on the primary side, or if you have a severe secondary fault, it will blow the fuse. That's what we wanted to do. We want to kind of try to, we want to try to protect our equipment with it. Two is if we blow the fuse here, then the rest of the primary line stays on. Okay. So when we talk fuses and transformers, this is a good example of what we're looking at. I don't go back to same plate, uh, I mean, the uh, spreadsheet, ah, Word document, Professor, go ahead. There you go. All right, guys, just like what he was talking about with fuse sizes and uh, transformers, uh, we, you see your transformers ranging anywhere from 5 kVA, and what you'll deal with mostly in the field probably is anywhere from 5 kVA down to 50 kVA for, you know, probably residential uses out there, these subdivisions. Um, you have multiple houses, uh, multiple customers off of a 25 kVA transformer. Well, you there there are some. Well, they, they are, they, it is a built-in issue that a transformer itself can stand some overload. Uh, we touched on that a minute ago, and that number, guys, is 150 percent transformers. Uh, let's say a, a 10 or a 15 kVA transformer can be overloaded up to 150%. So if I have a 15 kVA overloaded at 150, what's that, what's that number going to give me, guys? Anybody out there figure it for me? This is twenty two point five. Okay, how did you come? How did you come to that solution? Okay, so we know that one hundred percent would be just flat fifteen kVA. So then you have the remaining fifty percent. So you cut fifteen and a half, which would be seven point five, and then add that to the fifteen. Excellent, excellent. That's you know that's just going through simple framework. You really don't need to use a calculator on that. One hundred percent of fifteen kVA is fifteen. 50% of the 15 kVA is half of 15. So it's 70, I mean, 7.5 and just add the two together, 22.5. Now remember, <laughs> watch the question. He asked for KVA. Make sure you include that or you see that in your answer. That's a good way to do it. Does anybody have another way of converting? I got one. What's 15? What's 15 times 1.5? Anyone? 22.5. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So all I did there is I took the 150, converted my percentage down to decimal, and multiplied them together. Both. Doable, both correct. Who do we lose? Professor V. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, okay. So a little more explanation here. This is inherent to all transformers that are manufactured. I mean, obviously, if you remember my ball field lights, if, if I had a 15 kVA transformer and I had 15 1000 watt lights, well, what would happen if I added one extra light and I had 16,000? Would I want that transformer to stay on? No, you overload it. 
it's overloaded, but do I want that transformer to remain on? Yeah. Yeah, sure. So it'll take a little bit of overload up to 150%. Once you start going over the 150%, then you're gonna have to change that transformer out, right? It's not gonna be able to survive very long. And you know, we say short term period over 150%, uh, there's really a lot of factors that factor into that. You gotta factor in the heat, the temperature, uh, things that are starting up and stopping, everything like that. But we don't definitely don't want the power to go out. So that's why they have that 150% short term. And like I said, short term is hard to define. Is it a minute? Is it 10 hours? Depends on the situation there built into transformers. All transformers that are made, doesn't matter who the manufacturer is, will go up to 150% on the transformer. If that's the case for the transformer, and we figured the other day how to find out what the fuse size was, will the fuse also do 150%? Yeah, your neck. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the transformer manufacturers work in conjunction with the fuse manufacturers, and they say, if we have the capability of going to 150% for a short-term period, so must our fuse. So we determined the other day by Ohm's law that a three amp fuse goes in a five kVA transformer. So let's, well, we use the 15 to start, all right? So 15 will do 22.5, okay, in kVA. And we also determine that a 15 kVA takes a three amp fuse. What will the fuse do in overload? How many amps will this be in overload? We figured the kVA on a 15, 22.5. The fuse that also is fusing it will do what? 4.5. 4.5, excellent. Well, you take 100% of three, that's three. You take half of three, that's 1.5, add them together. Or you multiply three times 1.5 equals 4.5A. This is in amps now. Okay, Professor V, you're, I see you're back. So I just went from the transformer. I moved over to the fuse. Okay. Guys, I apologize. My internet is awful today. Yeah, <laughs> you're, you're working on McDonald's internet or something like that. I don't know. It ain't, I don't yeah. think, I think it's more the lines of Dollar General. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, did that cover the um, overload? It covered overload for both fuses and transformers. So if I have a 50 kVA transformer and it's overloaded to 150%, what, what is going to be um, the kVA? Somebody figure that out for me real let's, quick. Let's pick on somebody because we've got a lot of people that aren't answered. Hunter Strong. So, yeah, man. What's uh, what will the fifty kVA do in overload? So what now? What will the kVA kVA transformer do in overload? It'll go to one hundred and fifty percent. What is that value in kVA? I right, got a decimal. It's uh, 150. That's your answer? No, I'm doing the problem. Okay.
I know you got your sidekicks over there. How have them to help you out? I don't really know how to do this. Okay. okay. Let's, take, let's take 50 KVA. Yes, sir. All right. I like doing it this way. Some other people are doing it differently. I'm going to convert this 150% to a regular decibel number. Yes, sir. I did. You do, do 1.5. Yes, sir. All that's right. what I got. All right. So what's 50 times 1.5? You can use your calculator if you like. 75. Excellent. Excellent. 75 KVA. There's your answer. Sure. Good job. Is, is anybody else out there having trouble with that? Speak up, please, if you, if you are. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now, what if we have a, a 50 kVA transformer is overloaded to 150%, right? Right. All right. And has an impedance of 5.0. What is our true kVA there? Okay. Well, all right. And we already heard the answer for the overload value. What is that? 75. 75 kVA, right. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. So we've already determined that. And he is saying that I have a what impedance? A 5.0. 5.0 impedance. Okay. Let's do it these way. Let's take 75,000 minus five percent punch that in your calculator what do you get seventy one thousand two hundred and fifty seven right. one two six zero five zero five zero thank you five zero if he's asking for the answer in watts we're going to put a w if he asks you to convert that back to kva you're going to move your decimal point over three places to the left, 71.25 kVA. All right, good. Well done. Question, guys? Guys, and just, just like, uh, and I thought I missed part of coming on the tail end of on the fuse part of it, just remember that the fuse size the fuse can be overloaded to 150% as well as the transformer. Correct. Right. Okay. Guys, you got any questions about any of that so far? I have a question. So if, do you take the, do you always take the impedance after you know what it's overloaded to or do you do it before? That's really not gonna matter in the scope because we're using 150% Let's put it this way, 25 kVA, that never is going to change. That, would, that is what the transformer rating is and it stands solid. Let me go over here. All right, That's, that number is not gonna change as far as the kVA rating of the transformer. Neither will the impedance. All right, only when I go into overload. When I, value changes. Right, right, is when I do, do that. Your impedance does not change in overload. Got it. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Uh, okay, okay, great, great. I thought, I thought I got the gist of your question. Good question, though, great question. Yeah. Any more questions about you? Yeah. Can we do one more problem? Sure. Okay. Sure. Let me go to, I, I've done it on the screen here. I'm going to stop this share and go to uh, whiteboard. Okay. And I'm actually just going to keep my mouth shut, maybe, <laughs> and follow along as you go. Because I, I can't use a calculator and draw at the same time. Go ahead, Professor V. All right. What, which, um, what you want to do again, the KVA, the overload, or... Or how you want to do it? 
Can you do it with the impedance or whatever? Impedance. Sure, yeah, sure. I mean, that's the part I don't understand. Which yeah. one? The impedance? Yes, sir. Okay, the impedance, we, we talked about that being resistance, correct? Right? Yes, yeah. sir. All right. The the um the nameplate we just looked at a minute ago, it had a 15 kVA transformer on there. And did I lose you again? No, 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 I'm moving around. Okay. Okay. Um you know, if we got a 15 kVA transformer and our impedance is 2.6%. We're going to subtract that 2.6% out of that 15,000 to give us our true KVA. You understand that part of it? That, that's, that's taken away from that 15,000, right? Who asked a question about the uh, impedance, not understanding the impedance? I did. So, okay. Every yeah. time he's impedance, Think who was I did. Think of this, guys, whoever's played football out there, you're down there and you're a tackle on the ground, okay? And the coach puts his hands on your shoulders and he says, push towards me as hard as you can. He is trying to impede your progress. Same thing is happening here in the conductor of the transformer. Right. Yeah, he, he's trying to impede because there is no perfect conductor. Anyway. So... Okay. Figuring that once again, so we've got 15,000 watts. We're going to subtract 2.6% of that, which will give us 390. And that's going to give us 390 for a total of 14,610 watts. That is the true, when they say true KVA of that transformer. It's rated at 15,000, but because of the resistance or the natural resist resistance that are in those conductors inside that transformer, it's gonna lose, uh, what, 390 watts. And so that's gonna bring it down to 14,610 yeah, watts. Got, yeah. You got to listen to Professor V and myself when we ask for the wording of the question. And it can go multiple ways. Uh, yeah. You've got a 15 kVA transformer. It has a 2.6 impedance. How much watts are impeded? 390. All right? That's the end of your question. You've yeah. got a 15 kVA transformer is impeded by 2.6%. What's the true kVA? Well, I've got to take 390 away from 15,000, which is 14, 6, 10. Then I've got to convert that to KVA. I've got a 15 KVA transformer. It's impeded by 2.6%. You see, it's the same question all the time. I need to know how many watts it will output, 14,610. I just left it in watts. So you got to watch the question when that quiz question comes up. Am I asking how much is it being impeded by 390? I'm asking for the KVA in the answer, what's the end KVA? Or am I asking for what is the watts after I've impeded it? Your turn. Is that is that clear as mud or <laughs> <laughs> what? Let, right. Let's let's um Let's take a five, a 500 kVA transformer. You want to do a real easy one? Go ahead. 100. 100. 100's a round, yeah, nice round number. Okay. It's clear, clear all drawings. Okay, 100 kVA. Equals 100,000 watts. All right, go ahead, Professor V. Okay. Now, Let's, let's say that 100 kVA has an impedance of, I don't know, let's say 8%. 8%, okay. You want to do 8%? Oh, that's fine by me. Okay. Eight, I've got an 8.0. Sorry about that. 8%. So if we've got a 100,000 watts, 
we're going to subtract 8% out of that 100,000. How much is that going to give us? And this is the way you key it in. 92,000. 92,000. This is the way you punch it in your calculator. 100,000 minus 8%. Don't forget to put the percent symbol in your calculator. You end up with 92,000. Okay. okay. So how many KVA is 92,000? 92. 92. Right. KVA. How stands, many? Hold on a second. Many? K stands for kilo. 1,000. So I need to move my decimal place. 10, 100, 1,000. There's my new decimal place. 92 KVA. Go ahead, Professor. How, how many watts is that going to be? Oh. 92,000. Watts. 92,000 right. watts. All right. Okay. Does everybody remember that the KVA, that KVA is expressed in watts? Right. You guys Perfect. talked about that last week. How many watts were lost? 8,000. There you go. 8,000. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Questions or comments? Concerns? Is it? Is it becoming more clear or is it getting more clear? Yes, sir. Okay. All right, we talked about fuse sizes. Okay. Same thing. We had a three amp fuse. What will it do in overload? Four point five. How much? Four point five what? Amps. We asked for it. Amps. Remember, few sizes there is amps. Transformer is wattage. Okay. Questions. Does everybody understand that overload is 150%? Yes, sir. Is it, is yes, it always 150%? Okay. All right. <laughs> Time we hold it. Uh, Professor Shoemaker, do we want to take a break and then review over this quiz? And then yeah, yeah. I, I was muted, and we. I want to go over a little bit more of Ohm's law today too. Okay. Uh, I was muted, and I heard the question there: uh, Is transformer overload always one hundred and fifty percent? For our purposes, yes. Now, a transformer can go in overload, and what we call Every, anything over 100 is overload. It can go to 105. It can go to 130. All right. Once it goes to 150%, you're going to have to take action. It's, it's done. It's done, right? The fuse won't hold anymore. The transformer is going to melt down. That's why we use the 150% number. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. So it's, it's always going to be 150, unless you say otherwise, like up, up to correct. 150%. Correct, correct. Yeah, okay. uh, when you see it on quizzes, uh, here's who review this in a moment. What will a 25 kVA do in overload? Well, that's 150 percent for you. Okay. Okay. The thing is, when you get out there in the field and you say, "Well, I learned in college that a transformer will do 150 percent," and I'm getting my my calculations, a 25 kVA is hanging up there, like you see this, or the, let's use this 15. A 15 kVA transformer is hanging up there, and it's actually using 27 kVA. Well, that's over 150%. I need to change that transformer out. Okay. So you want to break? We can. Let's take 10 minutes. Let's take 10. 1025, gentlemen. 1025. Has got any questions? Guys, got any questions about overload or uh, KVA impedance and all that stuff? We good with that so far? Yay, nay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Guys, um, Professor Shoemaker. Yes, sir. Did, what else did you want to cover with your um before we review? 
Well, really, I was going to go into Ohm's Law, but we're getting, we're winding down here on the day. And I, you know, I did this the other day to give you guys an indication, you know, why am I learning this? Firstly, and I'm sure for Duke Energy, and I know for uh, Santee Cooper, where I came from, I could go out there in the field uh, with a service van on a service truck, and I could say, hey, I'm at this location, and they could just give you a quick answer. Yeah, that transformer's overloaded, change it out. All right. You might not have the benefit of using that dispatcher all the time. So many years ago, uh, what our process was is we would sit, we would pull up to a job site, we would have these readings and information, and we'd call an engineer. An engineer says, you have my approval to change that 25 kV out to a 50 kVA. Well, guys, that takes time. All right. You're going to be doing this, you know, at midnight, one, two, three in the morning. I can pretty much guarantee you an engineer's not going to answer. So you have to figure this information out for yourself. All right. Uh, and especially if the dispatchers are busy too and they're busy on something else. What we don't want to happen out there, and you've got somebody working with you, you're probably going to be a good checks and balance out there, is that if you have a transformer, and I'll give an example. Uh, it's a hot summer evening. It's 97 degrees. It's after hours. And you've got a transformer. You take some readings off of that. And we'll show you how to take readings later. And it's a 25 kVA. And you determine, well, this transformer is doing it about 27 and a half kVA. Is that overloaded? Yes. By 150%? Yes. No. no. 25 to 27. And you guys, I have to admit, you have to be somewhat of a little investigator. What's the temperature? 97. Yeah, the temperature's way up there. Okay. Everybody's come home from work, so everybody's home. So would you change that transformer out? Probably not. It could go for a while below the 150%. You got to look at the conditions that were going on. The mistake comes into where, oh, yep, it's, it's 25, it's doing 27, I'm going to change it out to a 50. Like, this is a pretty simple way of thinking about it. A 25 kVA is going to cost you about $2,500. That's what it's going to cost the company. A 50 is going to cost them about $5,000. you are going to put a transformer in place that's not cost effective. All right? Come in the next morning. You tell the engineer what you did. The engineer looks at your numbers and looks at your calculations. Guess what you got to go do? Get a 25 and replace the 50 you just installed. So, you know, this is really to the benefit of your life. How many times will you use it? Who knows? Maybe not once in a year, but the next year you might use it 10 times. Who knows? Okay, so that, that's why we teach in this fashion and we teach you do you need to know the math? Obviously, but I want, I like the real application out there. Well, Professor Shoemaker, why are you teaching me this? Is for one, be to be smart, okay? Two is to impress the people you're working for. And three is companies are all about saving a dollar. Think of it. Uh, tri uh, Professor V? Yes, sir. How many transformers do you think are on the Duke system? Hundreds, hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands. That if everybody were able, oh, yeah, we'll just upgrade that to a 50 where you don't need it. You could have a 25. Millions and millions of dollars would be lost in that process. Okay, Professor B, you can carry on. Carry on, my wayward son. Okay. Um, have you looked at the uh, quiz two yet? Let me get back to it. If you do, look at question 10 and tell me if we need to change that. Or do we need to go into that today? Quiz two. Ten. We'll edit that today. Okay. All right. So if there's no other questions uh, from what we've talked about today, and this the quiz we're going to do uh, today is actually going to cover um, some of the stuff you talked about last week when I'm, I think it was on last 
Wednesday, maybe when you guys talked about it, I missed that day. Um, and we'll talk about it some more if you need to, um, where you talked about um, amps and volts and all that kind of good stuff. So, um, so let's do a little review. This is going to be a short quiz for today. We're going to have 10 questions to it. And I know guys, I'm, um, uh, some of you guys are, you know, coming out of high school and, and um, you're into still in that mode of going to school and taking quizzes. Some of you guys may be, you know, been out for a little while and getting used to it. So we're going to kind of wean everybody back into the quiz routine and uh, keep it, you know, as easy as we can right now until we start getting into transformation and different things like that. And then it'll start getting a little bit tougher for you. So anyway, um, let's review a little bit here. Uh, guys, what does, um, what does for alignment KVA stand for? Those three letters. Kilovolt ampers. Kilovolt amps, okay. All right, we talked about this today. Um, what is a good definition for impedance? Resistance. Of? Amps. <laughs> it, 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 you're 99% you're, oh, you're there. Amps is the value. Right. Current flow is what's happening. Right. Very so, close to that one. Okay. Amps yeah, is the value so it, that we're reading that we were getting. Current flow is what's occurring in the conductor. Right. It's resistance of voltage and current flow in a conductor. So, um, and these questions are going to be multiple choice. Um, so pick the best answer, okay? All right, question three. Uh, 25 kVA has an impedance of 2.6%. What is the true kVA? Can you repeat that? I can. A 25 kVA has an impedance of 2.6%. What is the true kVA? Remember, he's asking for true kVA in the answer. True kVA. And Professor Schumacher, this is the one we're going to have to adjust to answer a little bit. All right. I've sent you something on chat. Okay. For number 10. Yes. Can you repeat that one more time? I can. A 25 kVA has an impedance of 2.6%. What is true kVA? Is it 24.99? Close. I got 24.35. Okay. Is it 24.35 what? kVA. Remember, when we're asking for KVA, give the answer in KVA, okay? If we're asking for watts, give us watts. Everybody got that? I, I see what you're talking about, Professor B. I'm going to fix it. Okay. I've got mine taken care of. Okay. All right. All right. This is something we talked about last week, guys. Define volts. What are volts? Electrical pressure. Pressure. Electrical pressure. Very good. Yes. Very good, guys. Okay. All right. How about define amps? Electrical flow. Oh. Flow. Who's giving me these answers? I think it's Logan Dennis. Yes, sir. Logan. Good job, Logan. <laughs> All right. Define what? I made a cheat sheet. <laughs> okay. Awesome. All right. Define what? Or power. Electrical power. Electrical power. The use of electrical power. Would that mean is that electrical pressure, electrical flow, or electric consumption? Light and heat. Yeah, he said use of. Yeah. yeah, he said use of consumption. Okay. Okay. I didn't hear that part. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
All right. What can a transformer be overloaded to for a short period of time? In percentage. In percent. Okay. Does everybody, I know that's something we just talked about earlier, but you just want to make sure everybody got overload is 150% for the fuse and the transformer, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. 25 kVA transformer can be overloaded to what kVA? 37.5 kVA. How much? 37.5 kVA. 37.5 kVA. 37.5 kVA. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Let's go back to this one again, this question. A 50 kVA transformer is overloaded to 150% and has an impedance of 5.0. What's the true kVA? 50 kVA is no, overloaded, 150% has an impedance of 5.0. What is my true kVA? 71.25. What? Okay. Yeah. That's 71.25. Watts? KVA. No, that's KVA. just the KVA. Thank if it you. was Watts, it's 71,000. All right. All right. Just checking. Just checking. All right. Okay. <laughs> Number 10. 10. A 50 KVA by your calculations and readings, is actually doing 60 kVA. It's a very cold night, and a lot of electric, electric heating is occurring in homes. Does this transformer need to be changed out, true or false? False. Why? Because I think it can run a little bit longer. It wouldn't be good to change out with all them people like running off of it. Right. Well, Save a dollar, well, like I said. <laughs> What will a 50 kVA do in full overload? What's the max? 75. There you mm -hmm. go. And we're only doing 60, and it's a very cold night. Yeah, there so it can go. last. There you go. All right. Awesome. Uh, Professor V, I put that in a chat for you. I see it. I'm reading it right now. Excellent. So you just copy and paste. I will. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Uh, we got that. We got our quiz down and questions down. You've got one homework assignment today. One. Either out there in the world or on the internet, find a transformer and its KVA and send me a remind with the transformer size and the fuse size. So if you go on the internet and you find me a 25 KVA, you're going to reply back to me, 25 kVA and a blank fuse. Make sense? You got, or are you going to take a picture of one that you see on a pole and it says 15 on it, 15 kVA and a blank fuse. You're going to tell me what the fuse size goes in it. Yes, sir. Okay. Do I need to climb the pole to get the picture? Huh? No, don't climb a pole. <laughs> you should be able to see it from the ground. Hey, that's what Zoom on your camera's for. Yeah. <laughs> if, uh, if you can't find one out there just riding around or whatnot, just get a picture of one off the internet. And tell me what the fuse size goes in it. Okay. Okay. I will take those on remind. Those are due by... Let's do this. Those are due by nine o'clock tonight, not midnight. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yes, sir. Okay. All hey, right. Hey, uh, I'm just going to, um, are we done with everything for today right now? I've just got one more thing I want to bring up just for the heck of, I like All right, I, okay, because I just want to throw a reminder out there for whoever's got tomorrow's safety meeting. Oh, okay. Well, hold on one second. Mm -hmm. Let's do a little bit of this just so you know your utility and you know your seasons. We talked a little bit about it today and touched on it a couple of places. So 
I see Brandon's face out there. Brandon. Yes, sir. What's your thermostat set on? Let me go check. <laughs> it's on 68 cool. Good grief. All right. Wait, is it my house? It's 68 cool. <laughs> Hold on one second. Where do you live? Just check. I live basically close to Northmore Beach High School. All right. NMB. All right, so it's 83 degrees. It's 83 degrees outside, and you've got your thermostat set on 68. So we've got a difference of what? 15, 20, 15, 15, 15 degrees. degrees. Okay. To be, this is kind of strange, guys. Uh, utilities, they, they call them heating cooling days. This is how they uh, determine and forecast their load uh, or the amount of amperage that's going to be used on their system. All right, so we'll keep it at 68. What do you usually do in the winter time, Brandon? Mm, probably like 73 heat. 73 heat, and we're gonna get kind of drastic here. It's gonna get, uh, let's just say it's gonna get 32 degrees outside. So subtract that. 41. 41. Okay, question, gentlemen. Which season is most demanding on an electrical system. Winter. 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 Fantastic. Okay. You actually, and you think of it, when I install a 25 kVA, and typically that'll run four homes, I have to install it for both summer, which is not too bad, and winter. So in some cases, when we talk about overload, <coughs> it may have to go into overload for a little bit. When it gets down to these real low temperatures. That's why we have overload on transformers. Obviously, I'm not going to install a transformer there that just meets the needs of the customer in the summer, then come back in the winter and change it out, then come back in the summer and change it out. That just is not logical. So that's, you know, when we talk these degree days and we talk overload on transformers, that's the meat and potatoes of why it's happening. Okay, Professor B. Any, got, any of you guys got any other questions about this stuff what we're talking about? What's for lunch? Cool. Sam it. Hey, who's got tomorrow's um, safety meeting? Who do we say? I do. Mr. Mark Elliott, and what are you 